to the families that, that still live on these lands that grew up here, the barn was the heart of the farm. I love this route up to the ridge here, and I have to imagine what Patty Anderson felt like when she got up onto this hillside 200 years ago, when she was heading up to the milk gap. The milk cow would have come down the ridge and stopped at the milk gap, waiting to be milked by Patty. What a wonderful way to start your day. Thanks for joining us today. Welcome. We're at this beautiful farm in eastern Madison County in western North Carolina, the Anderson Farm. My name is Taylor Barnhill. I'm with the Appalachian Barn Alliance. Our mission is to document the historic barn traditions of the Southern Appalachians. And this is one of the most remarkable pieces of property that we've documented, the Anderson Farm on Paint Fork Creek in East Madison County. This story goes back over 200 years. Remember, we had a brand new country. Our constitution was finalized in 1789, and this part of North Carolina began to be opened up in 1792. The county of Buncombe was chartered in 1792, its county seat was a tiny little town called Morristown. And then after that was created, there was this boundary that kept white settlement to the east called the East Indian Boundary. The powers that be at the time realized that that boundary had to be moved. So the native Cherokee were pushed farther west, opening this area up to white settlement. There was one land speculator who was involved with the Revolutionary War and if you remember your fifth grade history, those involved were given land grants. And the higher up you were, the more land you got. But this particular gentleman, John Gray Blunt, was given 320,640 acres. Hard to comprehend. That's, that's like three-fifths of the land of the Great Smoky Mountains. But right after that, James and Patty Anderson moved to this area. They first lived down on Gabriel's Creek, but after a few years, they took their children who were still at home, some of them had grown and left, and moved right here onto this property on Paint Fork Creek in 1797. That's also the year that the county seat of Morristown had its name changed to Asheville. This farm has, over the years, grown. I think the first acreage was about 50 acres, and it's, uh, it's been up to several hundred acres. It's been in the same family for over 200 years, going back to 1797. What do you say we head down the hill, see some of these amazing Anderson family farm buildings, the house, the cabin, the barns, and get to know how they came to be? We're down here in the heart of the James and Patty Anderson homestead. We're going to be looking at the evolution of barn building traditions here in the Southern Appalachians. And we have four wonderful examples of that tradition with the barns here on the Anderson home place. I want to show you one right now that is, it's one of my favorites and it's a remarkable piece of craftsmanship. This is a, a classic hand-hewn log cabin. Now, it was later converted to a barn, but let's go back 
200 years maybe, and talk about this as a cabin and the first cabin of James and Patty Anderson. Now we think that this was built up the valley here across in front of me, perhaps as early as 1797. We don't know that this actual log cabin was built that early, but one of the family historians think that it may have been. So we have this beautiful log cabin. It's a story and a half is what they describe this type as. You can see where the floor joists for the upper area came through these logs, these big square openings here. But one of the things that always catches my eye is this beautiful hand wrought iron hinge. This was wrought by hand by a blacksmith right here on the land that the Andersons owned. It may have been one of the Anderson men themselves who did the blacksmithing on this hinge. There's another matching one down here with this beautiful algae growing on it. So this, I'm always drawn to this original door. It could be all the way going back to 1797 or, or perhaps later. We don't really know. It's one of those oral traditions that we're, we're counting on to tell us the, the full story. Another feature of this door is this hand-carved wooden lock set. Now that tells me that this does go back many, many generations. There's a, a, a metal center part of the lock set that would have been fairly hard to find back in the pioneer settlement days. The bottom log near the ground, much more prone to moisture, would have been made out of white oak wood maybe American chestnut. And so we see that as the, a classic example of the sill log in the American log cabin. I want, to, I want to go around to the other side now and let's talk about how this cabin may have originally been built and then how it has evolved into the late 19th century. Okay, so let's walk around here. Now I, I move around to the back side of this beautiful log cabin because there are things going on here that tell us a little bit more about its history. You'll notice that there's these cut in the, this, this long cut in these logs on this side. And then you'll notice that these logs over here are a different color than these back here. Why is that? One other thing is that these logs have augered holes in them. And that means at one time they had pegs in those holes. What did they use pegs for? Well, that's where they hung their clothes and other things on the interior of the cabin. But it could have been pegs that were on a porch. So there's a lot of little clues about what this wall and this cabin's history is about. But one of the overriding questions about this cabin and many of these early cabins was, were they an, an independent singular log building or were they two log buildings connected with a dog trot. These kinds of clues indicate to me that they were two dog trot cabins. When you, when you see logs that are different on the corner, what was often happening was somewhere back in this building's history, that, that corner began to deteriorate with vines and too much water or a leak in the roof and the corner began to crumble. And so they would take two log buildings and combine them to make one solid log building. So that's part of the mystery that we're looking at with this uh, original old Anderson log cabin. So let's look at the, the corner notching on this particular log cabin. It's just right around here. Let's look how these logs connected at the corner. The oldest notch type, or corner notch as we call it, was this half dovetail. Now there's some parts of the country where they went to the trouble to make a full dovetail, but if you've ever tried to do that, you know that that's more work than it's worth. But this is a classic half dovetail hewn log notch. Each corner would have had a man working on the corner to get these logs up in place. They would trim out all the cuts smooth them out. The saying was always, you know, we're going to make that so tight you can't get a piece of paper in between. 
And so these are some beautiful examples of the half dovetail notching for a late 18th century, early 19th century log building. Let's walk around to this other side and talk about some of the other features of this log cabin. Okay, we've seen three walls of this beautiful ancient log cabin. We're here on the west wall. Let me point out this door here you haven't seen a chimney, right? So we believe that this is the original chimney opening into the cabin, um, and it later became a door for different reasons, but uh, we'll talk about those in just a minute. One of the other things we see on this side is the tear poles that you see coming through the log wall. Now remember, these log walls would have been chinked or uh, the openings would have been filled with clay to seal the house up so that it could be heated. The clay would have had anything in there to save on how much clay they used. So they would add rocks to it. They would add wedge-shaped boards to it. Uh, and they would, these would be tightly filled with clay chinking. At some point, when this was moved from the original home place up the creek, they would open these up, and at that period of time, a new cash crop had come into the economy of the Southern Appalachian Mountains, and in particular, our county of Madison. That cash crop was flu-cured tobacco. Now, hang with me, flu-cured, we're not talking about COVID, we're talking about a flu, like a chimney flu, and the tobacco being cured to make it ready for market. So flu-cured tobacco was introduced after the Civil War as a stimulus program for these uh, mountain farmers who had, who had suffered through the Civil War and they were desperately trying to get back on their feet economically. So flu-cured tobacco was introduced in 1870. This building, when it was first moved, probably around 1890, Instead of a log cabin, it was converted to be a flu-cured tobacco barn. And these tear poles above me tell me that that's the type of tobacco that was cured in this barn. Of course, they had to knock out all the mud chinking and open it up to, to get these tear poles in place. But then they, they, they chinked it all over again because flu-cured tobacco was heated. So we have these tear poles up here that are only two feet apart. They were closer than the burly tobacco tear poles, which were four feet apart, because they, they hung only bunches of leaves and not the entire burly tobacco stem. So that, that tells me that this log cabin was converted to a flu-cured tobacco barn as early as 1870. One of the other wonderful stories about this, uh, this old log cabin that has come down from the family tradition was that uh, James or perhaps his son Nathan or another descendant carved on the inside of one of these logs an, a box opening and that's where they put their safe box and that's where they hid their gold who knows it may have been their confederate money or their silver or whatever but they had their own little built-in safe inside their log cabin. I want to point out another important feature of these log buildings that, that I find this almost everywhere I go with these log buildings. If you can see up here these straight hatch marks on that log there and then you see another set right over there. What do you think that came from? Well remember these log buildings and this one in particular originated up the little valley here on the original home site of James and Patty Anderson. At some point, they decided to move it down here. So they, they take it apart, log by log, and they had to number the logs so that when they reached the new site, they knew which order the logs were gonna go back up in. Interestingly, these hatch marks of one log here and one log there don't match. One, one is not seven and the other one is eight. And that's another indication with this barn uh, that was the original cabin, 
that it was made up of two separate cabins and they were reassembled as one barn here where it stands right now. These log buildings, I call them the original mobile homes because they were often moved from their original construction site. Let's walk over to the big livestock barn over here. Come on with me. We're here now in the big hand-hewn log livestock barn. This is where the animals were kept. Uh, this barn was actually built in 1903 by D. Nelson Anderson. Off to my right is again the view of this beautiful valley where that Cherokee Indian trading path was. And it's just a, a perfect setting to build this classic Appalachian hand-hewn log barn. This barn, you know, one of the favorite parts of these big old log barns is all the, the old artifacts and implements that have been left in these barns. And, and when I come to this barn, the th first thing I notice is right up here, almost above my head, is these four containers. We've got a basket, we've got an old copper bucket, we've got two wooden boxes. Can you imagine why they're there and what they were used for? They've been there ever since I've known about this barn, which goes back uh, several decades. Well, those were nesting boxes for the hens. And at one point there was a, a shelf across here and the, the family kids, their job was to come out here and climb up on that shelf and reach up in there to gather the eggs. Now, I remember when I had to do that as a kid and I got pecked on the back of my hand a few times if the hen wasn't quite ready for me to get her egg out from under her. But it's, it's wonderful to see all of these surviving artifacts that have made it here still in this barn. Now we'll walk over here and look at several other things here. We have uh, old gears. You often find lots of horseshoes. I love these, these old rusty horseshoes. And you can tell that came from a a large uh, draft horse, maybe a Belgian or a Percheron, uh, even Clydesdales. Everybody knows about Clydesdales. Uh, down the old uh, the dipper, there would have always been some cold spring water nearby, and people would dip it out with this with this dipper. This particular kind of sawhorse device right here, uh, it's become a rare artifact now. When they were building these barns out of these huge logs, they had to get them up off the ground so that they could cut them square or cut off the sides square. And so you had these low sawhorses. They were not high like our carpenter sawhorses. And this one, in addition to being used for hewing logs, was probably also used for sharpening these tobacco sticks later on in the history of this barn. One end was sharp, the other end was not sharpened. And you see all the hatchet marks that go across the top of this sawhorse from sharpening these sticks. Now one of the, the features of these big hand-hewn log crib Appalachian barns were these beautiful notched corners where the logs came together. They were notched in such a way what, to make sure that any rainwater, if this was on the outside, ran off down these slopes. This barn that D. Nelson Anderson built is a little bit different from your classic barn. And I'm gonna move this out of the way and just talk about what he did. There was, I imagine there was a lot of sort of community competition among farmers. They were always trying to outdo one another. <clears throat> so D. Nelson decided to do his corner notches a combination of what is called a V-notch, like this, which is an inverted V, and a half dovetail notch, which is this, like the shape of a dovetail. And he decided to do those and alternate them on the corner. That was very unusual. Typically, you would have the corner notches where they were all half dovetail or all V-notches. So I love that quality about this barn. and. If I could bring him back into my life and into this uh, conversation, I'll bet you he would say, 
yeah, those boys down the creek, they, they were trying to tell me I didn't know what I was doing, and I, I showed them. So beautiful set of corner notching. Now this, this is a, a, known as a transverse three crib log barn. If you look down this wall right here, you see three stall doors, and that means there are three stalls formed by these log cribs or these log boxes. Some of the logs went the entire length of the barn. You see these, these top three logs right there. Look down the length of that. Those are one log hewn flat on two sides, and they came from one tree. Imagine getting that tree off the ridge line up there, dragging it down by, with a team of horses or oxen or mules perhaps, getting it down here, setting it up on several of these low saw horses, and hewing that side flat. So let's look at these, these stall doors. These are always a fascination to me. In fact, I'm going to show you one right here. Now, this particular stall door design is interesting because um, it, it tells me one thing. It tells me that D. Nelson Anderson probably worked with mules. Now, they loved working with mules. They were very smart. They were very stable on these steep hillsides. And they were also clever enough to do things that maybe they shouldn't always be doing. They were always playing tricks on you. And one of the tricks was that they could figure out the latches on their stall doors. This door is a great example of how either D. Nelson or his carpenter or someone came up with the idea of a gravity, see that slide there? A gravity door latch so that when it was closed, this would automatically slide down into place instead of a, a, a latch that was hinged that fell down into a keeper. Now what that meant was a smart mule that was in the habit of getting outside of its stall by opening its, its stall door couldn't get any leverage with its tongue or nose on this latch, and so it couldn't get through the door and sneak off. So it's a wonderful, uh, innovative design for a, a stall door. These doors are also made of, of oak. They're very solid. Uh, the hinges were probably formed and turned up there at the family blacksmith shop. And uh, it's just a, a wonderful combination of design and craftsmanship. Now, if you look down here on these bottom two logs, you see that very bottom log, that's called the sill log, typically made out of white oak because the white oak was much more rot resistant and strong. And then this next one, <clears throat> likely in this case, made out of pine. So notice one thing about this, this beautiful oak door and how high it is above this threshold log. When you open that door, Im imagine the animal that lives in that stall having to step across that very high threshold. Now, I've often hold, heard farmers tell me that the, whoever was in charge of the milk cow, which was usually the mom, she would say, now, Harvey, you can't ask me to have my cow step across that big threshold and stay in that stall. It would, it would keep her udders full of splinters, and she wouldn't want to ever go back in there again. So they would not keep milk cows in these stalls, typically. There was usually another barn or shelter, maybe out here under this overhang, where the milk cows would stay. Those are the kind of wonderful stories that I hear with all of these barns that I visit. How the, the farmer and the, and the farmer's wife always interacted in making sure they had the best care for their farm animals. And again, another wonderful thing about these old barns is the, the artifacts that, are, that have survived over the decades. And here on the in the floor of the hallway of this barn is this big sled. Now you see these timbers on the bottom here. Those are the runners, actually. It looks like a big platform, and of course it has, it's loaded down with some bricks and boards. Down at the other end, you have the front end where the front of the runners were covered in sheet metal. 
to make them more durable because it was always encountering rocks and things across the, the land as it was being pulled. It would be pulled by a horse or mule or a team of horses or mules, and it was virtually the vehicle of the farm, the mountain farm of the day. Now, why was that? If you have a, a wagon, you've seen old farm wagons, if the wagon was up on that hillside there, there was the risk of it tipping over or that it would roll away with you. You always had to be paying attention to the brake and what the animals were doing and that kind of thing. The sleds would never run, run away with you and they were just ultimately stable. They used them for virtually anything that needed to be hauled, like if they were clearing field rocks from the fields, if they were hauling firewood. During the tobacco era, they may have had it loaded down with tobacco coming in from the field. It may have been loaded with a full uh, load of hay from cutting hay and getting it back to the hay loft. And, and many farmers have told me that, yeah, we even used our sled to pull the kids down the road to, to go to church service. And they loved it, and it was the best way to get to church down the road. So the sleds were used for just about anything that needed to be moved. I've walked down to the south end of this, the hallway of this big livestock barn. I'm looking at this beautiful eight inch square hand hewn beam uh, that's supporting all of these other hewn beams. Uh, and you can tell by the size of those that they were meant to bear a lot of weight. The loft above was going to be handling uh, all kinds of uh, equipment and huge amounts of hay. And in some barns, as we'll talk about in a minute, they could actually drive a team of horses into the, into the hayloft floor. So I'm going to walk up the other side toward the loft now. Here we are. We're in this big, beautiful hayloft of this livestock barn. Wonderful space, very airy with this beautiful lattice work that, that forms the walls of this barn. Uh, lattice was the, the, the traditional wall for the loft level of these Appalachian livestock barns. For one reason, the, the loft needed to breathe. It needed to have good airflow to keep the hay seasoned, keep the hay from getting damp and moldy. So this lattice work was the perfect solution to that. All these little individual strips of wood cut at a sawmill that was pulled by a team of horses. It was steam powered and these moving portable sawmills were moved from one farm to another to do all the sawn work, not the hewn logs, but all the, the sawn boards. The other advantage of this lattice work is you look at it and it's what? It's making triangles and a triangle is the most rigid form of a structure and it keeps the, the barn rigid and keeps it from racking from one side to another, keeping it stable, making it strong and the strongest winds that are coming down off of this hill here in the wintertime. So the lattice is multi-purpose and is a beautiful, elegant way of doing that. Up here we have this roof structure uh, supported by these two inch by six inch hemlock roof rafters. And between those rafters you have these thinner strips of wood. And when you see the way they're installed, the spacing, it tells you that this barn once had a wood shingle roof. Well, Actually, every building in the mountains had a wood shingle roof prior to metal roofing coming in, which we think was about 1915. So that's a, that's a good indication to tell you that this barn started with a, a wood shingle roof. The other thing we see is the roof is steep. And if it had wood shingles, they would want the rain and the snow to work its way off the roof quickly so it could dry out and the wood would not begin rotting. By now, you've noticed all these round vertical poles around me, and you've noticed some of these horizontal round poles, and you're thinking, wait a minute, 
they can't drive a wagon full of hay in that kind of hayloft because it's full of poles. Where did they come from? Well, at the end of uh, what would it have been, the, the 19 teens, burly tobacco was introduced in the Southern Appalachian region and really took off. The markets were strong. And so farmers began to grow burly tobacco. It was a hybrid that was created up in Ohio and became famous in Kentucky. But burly tobacco was, was a kind that where they uh, cut the entire stalk at the ground when it was ripe, when it was ready to be taken in to be cured. And um, so the best, it was air cured. So the best place to air cure burly tobacco in that early part of the 20th century was these big airy livestock barns. So they began to convert the hayloft of the livestock barns into hanging burly tobacco up in this very breezy livestock hayloft. And it became, it was a perfect, perfect solution. Now the way they did that, they had to put in all these vertical poles and these were these were uh, white pine poles because young white pines grew so straight. And then the horizontal poles, probably white pine or poplar wood. And they were spaced on four foot centers, both vertically and horizontally. They hung the tobacco stalks on a stick like this. Some people call it a tobacco stake because it's actually driven into the ground when they're cutting the tobacco stalks out in the field. So they would, they would hang the entire stem on this, on this tobacco stick, and then they would hang it, it's very heavy at that point, and they would hang it between these two, what they called tear poles. The horizontal round poles were called tear poles. Now I've found these barns where the enterprising farmer decided he would just get his tear poles at the local sawmill and he would bring in this wagon load of rough sawn two by four or two by six tear poles. If you've ever stood barefoot on a sharp edge sawn splintery board, you can imagine that this round tear pole was much preferred by all of us who were working in tobacco back then. The, the stake itself, this one is, is virtually an antique. You see how rough it is. That's because it was hand split from hemlock wood. Hemlock wood split very easily. The local people would say, yeah, hemlock, you can't always get good boards if it's too old because it gets shaky. That means its grain would start to separate while the tree was still standing. But it split really nicely for making tobacco sticks. And they would hang uh, four feet across. They were, they were four feet long, span the four feet across the tear poles for hanging the tobacco. This barn has five levels of horizontal tear poles. So they could, they could hang five levels of tobacco all the way up to the, the peak of the roof. You didn't want to be in certain places on these tear poles when the tobacco was being handed in to you from the sled or the wagon. If you're on the lower tear poles, all the trash from the tobacco, which includes you know, sticky nicotine and sand and all kinds of mess falling down on you, getting in your eyes. So the preferred place was up at the very top of the roof near the peak because you were picking up the stick from below and nothing was falling on you from above. You did have to deal with the waspers. There was always a wasp nest or a yellow jacket nest up there. And you had to deal with 120 degree temperatures in the summertime. But uh, there's, there's all kinds of, of oral tradition around working in tobacco and where you wanted to be as a young person in these tobacco barns. You know, it's interesting to follow the different kinds of technology that were involved in, in growing tobacco here in the Southern Appalachian Mountains. For most of the, the period of the burly tobacco growing, uh, the, the, the leaves were pulled off they were graded at one time as many as seven different grades of leaves, depending upon the quality from the best to the worst. And then uh, they were carefully packed 
in on a big basket uh, and then that basket was then taken to market. That basket was the way to haul it to market. Later, because of the changes in the tobacco company industry, the markets, the globalization, uh, the grading of the tobacco leaves was not as important. And so they began to uh, get away from the very carefully handing, handling of the tobacco leaves and the, and the very selective grading and they began to bale it like a bale of hay. This is an early tobacco baler. It's basically like a big trash compactor. Uh, you put the tobacco leaves down inside, down in there, and then you would take this lid and it would sit on top. This one, I think, actually used a car jack to compress this lid down and, and mash the pile of leaves tighter and tighter and tighter. And then after they felt like they had compressed them as much as they could, they would release that bale, a square bale of tobacco leaves by lifting off the door on the front. And then they'd take it out and they'd stack it on a trailer or the back of a truck or whatever and haul it to market. So this is uh, probably a 19... Uh, late 1980s, 1990s era tobacco compactor. We're lucky today. We just happened to stumble across a, a, a piece of equipment that's gotten to be pretty uncommon. Uh, it's handmade. It's called a grading board. Now, I was talking about grading all the different uh, quality leaves of tobacco. I'm standing in what is known as the casing room, and I'll tell you about that, but let me show you this, this uh, grading board right here because they're, they're getting to be very rare. This particular one had one, two, three, four, five slots for five different grades of tobacco. So the very highest quality tobacco leaves may have been stacked in that slot there. At some point, they, after they got a certain number of leaves, the person would take the stems, reach, them, reach in there and take the stems, take another leaf and wind it around the top of the stems to tie it tight and closed. And that was called a hand, one hand of tobacco leaves. So they had the five different grades. They would do that and, and pile it on one of those big wooden tobacco baskets made out of oak. And that's how they would haul all of that tobacco to market. But this is a, a rare example of a surviving uh, grading board. You see the sticks can come out and go down into the different holes. And uh, boy, I'm glad we found that. So I'm standing in what was known as the casing room. That means that when the tobacco had finished curing up in the, in the, this case, in the loft of this big barn, it uh, was ready to go into case. And that meant the, the farm family and the neighbors were waiting for a cool, maybe a rainy day, but a cool and moist, foggy day. When that happens, the tobacco leaves, instead of being very brittle and crumbly, they become very soft, they absorb water, and sometimes you could, you could stretch them out. They felt almost like suede leather. They were so pliable. So when they get like that, it's time to take them out of the loft, tear them off the tobacco stalks, and bring them in here and begin grading them, and then tying them into hands, piling them on this big square oak basket. And you had this, this space here to do all that in. You'd have the family and neighbors, people coming together to help to get it done while the, the atmosphere was right. This before, this before Burley tobacco was being raised in this area before, say, 1920, this would just have been an open hallway. Uh, and it would probably have been for the milk cow or other activities that were happening here. Uh, to close it in, they, of course, built... Um, this high wall with these windows in there. Uh, another feature that you can see here that uh, shows how this was a bank barn. Uh, 
is this big rock retaining wall and they topped it with this big hewn oak beam before they framed in the windows to turn it into a casing room. So this is a great example of uh, the, the era of Burley tobacco. Now I found another wonderful artifact here while I was looking at this grading board. It looks like a cow horn, right? You got that? It's actually not. This is called a dibble. And when uh, before they had tobacco planters that were pulled by tractors and you had two people sitting on there uh, sticking young tobacco sprouts into holes that the planter made, people would go through the field and on their hands and knees would make holes in the ground with this dibble and stick the tobacco, young tobacco uh, sprout into the ground with this and then they'd pack the soil around it. It was always interesting after they had planted a whole field of these tobacco sprouts because they immediately wilted and just fell over on the ground. And the person might drive by that wasn't familiar with this crop would see that and they'd say, oh, Isaac's lost his whole crop, that's too bad. But on the third day, they rose <laughs> and these little sprouts would stand up and it was, an amazing phenomenon to, to watch. I'm standing in another type of log barn, and it is a big log barn, one huge, what we call a crib of logs. The, the end measures a little over 30 feet across the end. The length behind me measures over 35 feet. And if you count them, there are 100 logs in this barn. Imagine finding this many straight trees, number one. Uh, if you ever have a chance, go out, find a straight tree about eight to 10 inches in diameter and cut it down and make it 35 feet long and drag it a uh, quarter of a mile and then imagine doing that 99 more times. I mean, this barn just amazes me. And that's what they had to do to build this barn. It's very atypical of the barns in the area. And when I discovered this barn a number of years ago, I could not figure it out. I, I understood log crib, livestock barns. I understood flu cured tobacco barns, burly tobacco barns, but this didn't meet any of those, those criteria. So, um, and then I started measuring it and these horizontal poles, which if you remember are called tier poles, were an odd spacing. Your flu cured tobacco spacing for tier poles is about two feet because they're just hanging bunches of leaves. Remember that? Um, burly tear pole spacing is about four feet because they're hanging the whole stem. This tear pole spacing averages about three feet. And I'd never come across that before. This, this barn was such a mystery. I wrote an article about it for the local county newspaper. And it was titled something like, Mysterious Barn on Such and Such a Branch. And I was hoping somebody would write in and say, oh, I understand that type of barn. I was, I was born, you know, 10 years after it was built, and Daddy told me all about it. And didn't hear anything from anybody for a couple of months. And then, lo and behold, I get this letter from Knoxville, Tennessee. And the gentleman grew up right in this valley, and he began to tell me all about this barn. And about the same time, Another younger gentleman who lives right up uh, Paint Fork Creek uh, gets in touch with me, and he knew all about this barn. In fact, he was actually using it to hang burley tobacco in that summer. So what I found out was that this barn was used for curing a totally different type of tobacco, a third type of tobacco called dark tobacco or Around here, they called it bullface tobacco. I imagine, uh, and my research bears this out for the most part, bullface was connected to Washington Duke, who uh, 
you created one of the big uh, tobacco industries down in Durham and the Durham Bulls, uh, Bull Durham. And uh, they, I grew up in Durham and they had acres and miles of tobacco warehouses. So I was very used to uh, Bull Durham and the Bull, the Durham Bull baseball team and all that. So finally, after all these years, I learned where that term comes from. And this was called Bullface Tobacco. Now, I still didn't know why they called it Bullface, but I was over here by the fence one day, and one of the, one of the big bulls that lives here walked up, and I'm looking at this guy, and his forehead is full of thick, curly black hair. And uh, I think, okay, well, dark tobacco or bullface tobacco was a curly-leafed tobacco. It looked like curly kale, if you've ever seen that. So um, it, all, it all started to fall into place. So this was a curly-leaf tobacco, and it only grew about three feet tall. And that made sense relative to the spacing on these tear poles. So that was uh, very, very satisfying to have all those pieces fall into place. There was still one huge mystery. This huge barn was built in the bottom of a ravine. Now, no good farmer in his right mind would build a building down in the, in the foot, in the bottom of a ravine because of moisture because of flooding after a big thunderstorm. And, uh, you know, you just wouldn't build it here. And you don't want your foundations to rot out. So I, uh, I tried to figure out what is that going on there. And um, I was over here one day and there was this big thunderstorm and a stream of water coming down off the mountain, down the ridge, and just running right through the middle of this barn. Well, part of the story about bullface tobacco is it was not heat cured. It was not air cured like Burley. It was smoked. It was smoke cured. And they, the farmer and his, and his kids and neighbors would go out and they would cut all kinds of green branches and things that wouldn't burn well, wouldn't burn fast. They'd make a huge pile on the ground in the middle of the barn after they'd hung all the tobacco if they wanted, and then they would start this smoldering fire, just something that would smoke heavily, they might add a lot of sawdust, uh, you know, uncured green sawdust that smokes really heavily. And um, they would get this whole building full of smoke. The logs were spaced just enough to allow the smoke to seep out the sides. And... Um, now, if they want, and, and the, other, the other part of this bullface tobacco was it was chewing tobacco. So if they wanted a cherry-flavored chewing tobacco, they'd go back up on the hills and they would they'd shave off cherry bark from our Appalachian cherry trees and add that to this slow smoldering fire. And it would flavor the tobacco with a cherry flavor. They may go down and get a bunch of old apple culls, ones that weren't going to be used for anything, and throw them in there, and the chewing tobacco would have an apple flavor. So that was, uh, that was part of that story here in curing this tobacco, but I couldn't quite understand the ravine part. And then I see in my imagination this huge pile of ashes and old debris that's left over after the fire's gone out, the tobacco has been smoked. It's been taken out. And somebody had to go in there and clean up that mess. So they just waited for the next big thunderstorm. And the, the, the rain came down the hill and washed right through here and flushed the barn. And I thought, that is, that is just ingenious. And this barn is over 100 years old. And so all the moisture uh, was not, you know, uh, that, that damaging to it. So um, it was a wonderful uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, investigative search trying to understand this barn. We think this barn, uh, according to the family oral tradition, was built about 1915. 
And that was about the same time that uh, metal roofing for houses and barns came available. And so this barn has always had sheet metal roofing, you know, what we call tin roof. Um, and the family was probably affluent enough at that point to be able to afford metal roofing. Uh, and they never put the split white oak shingles on this particular barn. So 1915 seems like uh, not that long a time ago, but it's over 100 years ago, and the barn has actually held up pretty well. Right now, because of all the moisture and everything, it's the favorite spot for the cattle to come in and cool off. I, I was just saying, boy, if I ever need to uh, replenish the nutrients in my garden, I'm coming back here. Okay, now we're outside looking at this barn. Remember, this is made of 100 logs, very straight logs from very straight trees. Now, I restored a log barn once and we had to replace about six logs that were only 20 feet long, but we had 73 acres of trees to choose from. And I could not believe how difficult it was in the mountains to find a straight tree. You look over on the mountainside and you see all these straight trees and you go up there and then you stand under it and look up and it's got a bow in it. And the other problem is you fell it, you cut it down, and as soon as it hits the ground, it turns into a big bow uh, because of the, the tension and the fiber that it's been growing on the hillside. So this is a remarkable collection of logs in and of itself. And again, these, these farmers depended upon choosing the correct species of trees for, you know, all kinds of reasons to make sure they would last, uh, number one. They cut them at the right time of the year. They cut them when the moon was, was dark at the, uh, what do you call that, the, uh, the dark of the moon, <laughs> the new moon. <laughs> and they cut it when the sap was down, which means the cold months. And they cut them when it was in the right signs, meaning the signs of the zodiac. So add all of those things and then come up with a 100 straight logs. It's remarkable. Down here on the bottom, they, they started this stack of logs with an oak log. Again, the oak had a tighter grain. It had those tylose cells in it, and it, they resisted water flow in the wood, and it, it didn't rot as readily. Then they started up with what is called Virginia pine. Now, most farmers call that uh, trash pine because it's really not good for much of anything. It doesn't make good boards or whatever, but it grows in these big groves, if they're young, of very straight trees. So most of these sidewall logs are Virginia pine. Now, inside, they went with white pine. And apparently that was a stand of trees that was young and all very straight. You know, they grow straight because they're all trying to find the sun at the same time, competing with one another. So the combination of uh, the white pine on the inside for the tear poles and the Virginia pine on the outside was, was a deliberate selection by the farmer that built this, most likely D. Nelson Anderson, who built the other buildings we've talked about. These, these corner notches are an, a slight variation from a V notch. You know, we talked about a half dovetail notch, which was typical for the bigger log cribs or in log cabins. Um, but for this type of barn, uh, they didn't want to spend that much time on the corner notches and they didn't have to. So this is a V notch, but it's it was done quickly because you can tell it doesn't make that sharp V that you saw down in the big livestock barn. So you can, you can look down that wall of the barn and you can tell that just under the sheer weight of all of those logs, a few of them over the last 105 years have kind of squirted out to the side, and, but they're still there and they could be easily repaired and gotten back into alignment uh, if this barn was really worth anything to do that with. The tobacco program has ended. 
this barn as well as all the other tobacco barns are no longer income producing so there's very little incentive to invest in repairing these old century old barns we're going to go over and look now at the what we call the new barn uh, it's still you know an old barn but uh, come with me and i want to show you uh, this this latest barn and the last barn that the Anderson family built down the valley here. We are here at the youngest of the Anderson family barns. This burly tobacco barn is only 73 years old and it's a great example of the changes in that burly tobacco history. This was built by Oscar Anderson uh, Sr. And uh, it, it's remembered because Oscar Anderson Jr. was 16 years old when this was built. And that puts it at 1947. One of the things about that period, remember, World War II has just ended and all the folks who were overseas fighting or at home uh, taking care of our war effort had become uh, had be begun to come home and uh, some of them uh, were wounded and crippled many had been killed but there was a, a huge effort to rebuild the economy so 1947 was a crucial year for these southern appalachian farms and this barn would have been built to accommodate kind of a surge in tobacco production. Now this field all through here would have been totally covered in burly tobacco. As, as far as you can see, every cleared area would have been covered. Now this barn is unique compared to the other Anderson barns because it wasn't built for livestock. It wasn't built for smoking tobacco. It was built exclusively to air cure burley tobacco. The earliest barns that were built uh, for that purpose went back to the 30s. And before that, if you remember, uh, the old flu cured barns were uh, opened up, the chinking was knocked out, and burley tobacco was hung in those old log flu cured barns. And then they began to take those big, beautiful haylofts remember with the lattice siding, and hang tobacco in those by installing horizontal tear poles, those long horizontal poles that we saw earlier. But they, didn't, they weren't building separate barns until the 30s for burly tobacco. And then they started building ones just like this. You can see the siding, the board siding, has big gaps in, the, in between the boards to allow a lot of airflow. Uh, on the interior, uh, the tear poles, again, are spaced at four feet apart for hanging the tobacco, and then uh, horizontal ones are four feet apart. And it's just a huge space frame on the interior for hanging and air curing that burly tobacco. Uh, Madison County was the largest producer of burley tobacco in North Carolina, and acres of it were grown right here and air cured here in this barn. Now, of course, I'm standing next to a lot of, of hay. And uh, when the tobacco program ended in 2004, the government uh, support program, uh, tobacco disappeared in, on most of these fields and hay production took over. And these fields, many of these fields were converted to beef production. So these old big airy Burley tobacco barns became hay storage with these huge circular bales of hay. We've been talking about, you know, a, a, the evolution over 220 years of these barns on the land of one family uh, that was started by James and Patty Anderson when they moved here in 1797. It's, it's a remarkable story. We're very grateful to the Anderson family for allowing us to spend this time with them and share it with you and also grateful for the care that they have taken in maintaining all these beautiful old buildings.
Um, it's not easy. And when the tobacco program ended, which was the last cash crop uh, program that these farmers enjoyed, uh, these barns were not income producing. So it was, it's difficult for most mountain families to be able to uh, sustain these barns and take, and take care of them. So uh, we're very grateful to the Andersons and that we have these barns. You know, Madison County has over 10,000 barns, and uh, unfortunately, many of them are deteriorating very quickly. Some are being uh, sold and torn down to sell the, that romantic-looking barn wood for new buildings, and um, so we're losing our barns very quickly. And the Appalachian Barn Alliance, in its mission to document the historic barn building traditions of these Southern Appalachians uh, is out there in the field on the hay trying to uh, work with landowners and keep these barns here where they've been for so many years. So thank you very much for joining us today on this barn tour. Uh, hope you've enjoyed it. I sure have. It's been fun. What a beautiful time of year, beautiful weather. So, uh, I hope I'll see you around.